Hey, Grace Life. Amen. All right, let's welcome those first-time guests with us today and welcome the first-time guests with us online as well. Thank you. As you can see, I'm not Jimmy. Uh, my name is Brian Harkai. I'm an Army chaplain here at Fort Jackson, and also I'm an elder of Grace Life Church, and it is such an honor and a privilege to be able to be here with you to, to serve you, uh, to serve God, and, and to serve his community. Um, one of the reasons why I get to be here today and have this wonderful opportunity is because Jimmy and Ramona are celebrating their 25th anniversary. Can we give them a hand as well? It's not too often that you could celebrate and appreciate the pastors uh, for what they do for your life and what they give up uh, to serve God and to serve you. And so anyway, I am privileged and honored, like I said, just really just to be able to be here and uh, to be able to preach and, and kind of give you the word that uh, the Lord has spoken to me. <clears throat> I will tell you that um, I've struggled about what I want to talk about. Uh, you know, this past week, and when Jimmy said, hey, uh, you know, I'd really like for you to preach for me. And I'm like, okay, I, I got a great text that I've, I've been wanting to preach. And so I started looking in and, and God said, nope, not that one. So I said, no, no problem, no problem. I got another one. So I searched over and he said, nope, not that one. I said, okay, oh, <clears throat> I got one that's a really good one because I use it in my life group, right? And so I'm going to get that one. And God said, nope, and then not that one. And uh, I'm, Josh, I'm making a pizza. I'm making a pizza, man. All right. So anyway, so I decided, hey, I'll just, I'll just talk about my story. And God said, yeah, because you know what, Brian? Your story is really my story. And that's the story that someone needs to hear. So I'm not so sure. Uh, who needs to hear this, but I'm sure that, that God has already prepared you and, and me and for whatever the word that, that God is going to be presented today, that, uh, that'll be true. So um, I'm going to say a quick prayer and we'll get started. Uh, Father God, I thank you for this time that you have set aside, Father God, for all of us to be together so that your word, Father God, may go from out this place and to those who are here May the hearts be open and ready to receive, Father God, your scripture, your word that changes lives and transform them for eternal. We thank you, Lord God, for uh, this message and for what you're going to do today. And in your holy and precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So listen, uh, next May, I'll be retiring from the Army after 32 years. And so that is excited about that. It's been a long time. I have no idea what I'm going to wear, you know, throughout the week now. So I'll have to figure that out. That's a new one for us, honey. Um, I'm sure she'll love to do that, help me out with that. But <clears throat> yeah, so it's been great. Uh, all that, uh, that God has provided for us um, the last uh, 22 years, uh, you know, July will be 22 years of marriage. And so we spent the entire time in the military traveling all over the place. And um, and so we have lots of experiences and lots of things that God has done for us. So I'm sure that he's going to provide something uh, for us to do outside of this and, and whatever happens next. But I really want to tell you a little bit about my story and kind of where it started and how my story becomes our story uh, and the extended story about how I got here today. So that started back in uh, 1988 when I enlisted in the Army. And uh, I, was, I was pretty excited, went to Fort McClellan, Alabama as military police guy. And then <clears throat> later I found myself going to college and then I uh, went through the ROTC program. I got my commission as a second lieutenant in the United States Army Reserve as a military police officer. And that was pretty good. And so uh, after five years of college on the five-year plan, I don't recommend that for your children who's here today, um, but you know, uh, but finally graduated and uh, found my job working for NASA. Cool, huh? Yeah. Well, oh, oh no. no. So, so it's not the NASA that you're probably thinking about. All right. That's why we don't want to clap because you know everything. Everybody's thinking, you know, Kennedy Space Center. We got you know rockets going up in, in Houston and all this other stuff. No, this is not that. This is in Fairmont, West Virginia. And so, I mean, nobody knows there's a NASA in Fairmont, West Virginia. But I, I do because I got a job there. Uh, and it's called the Independent Validation and Verification Facility. So, wow, really, what do they do? Well, first of all, it, they take all the data that, that's coming from all the space stations and satellites, and then it goes to this place. So here I am with my uh, five-year bachelor's degree in criminal justice guarding big tape recorders, really. <laughs> 
That's, that's kind of really about what it was. And so uh, not too exciting, uh, but that's important in my life. And, and I think it's important to be able to share with you because um, while I was there working for NASA for three years, I, uh, something really uh, tragic happened in, in, in my life uh, that kind of set me on a trajectory to, to where I, I am today. And so th this, was, um, this was pretty tough, and, but I had a friend there uh, his name was Brian Stutler. He helped lead me to the Lord. He helped me teach. He taught me how to read the Bible. We, we talked about the Holy Spirit. We, we enjoyed uh, scripture together. And it was pretty exciting that I was encouraged to go to work on the midnight shift for 10 hours because I, I knew that Brian and I were going to read some scripture and talk about God. And that, and that was, that was kind of new for me. But I decided that God was going to call me off onto another Place. So after three years, I decided to go on active duty uh, with my job. And my first duty station was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And yeah, I was excited about that. That's where I met my lovely wife, Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer was in the Army Reserve at the time. She was working as a military police officer. And so the whole story, she doesn't want me to tell this, but I'm going to tell it anyway. So the whole story goes, uh, if you want to know, people always ask you, well, how did you guys meet, right? So I would say that we met on a non-millimeter range. And, and I, I think that's pretty unique in self. So my job was to, uh, I, was, I was the operations officer for MP Battalion, and I was supposed to evaluate her unit. But of course, she tells everybody that I was really evaluating her instead of everybody else. And so that's why, that's why we met and we got married. She's shaking her head no. So... But that's true, that's true. That's where we, that's where we, we first met and, um, and God took us through a, a lot of things um, you know, while we were there in Pittsburgh. A little bit about my spiritual faith. You know, while I was there, I needed to make sure that I was connected to somebody uh, when I left West Virginia because I was so excited about what God was doing in my life. I just wanted to, to find a place where I could connect. I found a church in Wilkinsburg, Pennsylvania uh, called the Covenant Church of Pittsburgh. And the worship was just phenomenal. Kind of like worship here. Was the worship great today? We do want to celebrate that. I, I'm just telling you. You know, when God moves in places like this, and he was moving in his church that I was at, and, and, and I just felt myself like I wanted to be there almost every day, you know? Have you ever been like, and you go to church and say, is there an event going on today? And the doors were locked and closed. And like, no, Brian, you have to come back another day, you know? And so, but I, I was there on Sundays. I came back on Mondays. We had worship practice and we had youth on Wednesdays. And then on Fridays, we had, we had prayer groups. And I was, just, I was just like going crazy. I remember sitting in my office one day and when the battalion chaplain came and, and he just sat right across from me and just stared at me. I was like, uh, Chaplain, you, you okay? Uh, what's going on? He said, you ever thought about doing ministry? I'm like, no, no, that, that is the farthest thing for me in my life. And uh, he said, uh, well, you know, I kind of noticed that you've been praying for and counseling more soldiers than I get to counsel. And so um, I think that God has something going on in your life. You just need to evaluate that. And I said, okay, um, okay. Thanks, chaplain. So he left, and I'm like, man, I got to know, know what he's talking about. <clears throat> and so I'm like, I, I don't, God's not calling me to go to ministry. I'm just enjoying church. I'm enjoying getting to know God, this relationship, and all this is great. So, okay. So it happens about uh, six months later, I go to Jennifer, and, um, and as a matter of fact, we had just got engaged, and I, and I told her, I said, hey, I really think God was calling me maybe to do something more. So I'm going to check out the seminary because I, I got to go get a master's degree anyway. So why don't I just go do this? And she said, okay, if God's telling you to do that, that, that sounds great. And uh, so, all right, so we got the wedding plan. We're going through all this. I walk into the seminary and I have my uniform on, right? And I just kind of walk in like this and said, um, is this where you get a degree? And they're like, oh, thank you for coming. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? They said, no, we've been waiting for you. I said, me? They said, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we want you. We, we've been praying for someone in the military to, to come in and, and really just to, to be a part of our school. And I'm like, okay, that sounds kind of strange, but okay, I'll, I'll, I'll buy along. You know, what's going on? They said, no, 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 seriously. Are you looking for an MDiv? I sure am. I get my master's of divinity. That sounds great. They said, you married? I said, well, I'm getting ready to be. And they said, okay, so you and your wife could come live on campus. I'm like, oh, that's, that's a lot. And so you want me to quit work and move here full time? Yeah, yeah, and if you do, then we have a grant that'll pay for, for you for the next three years. I'm like, 
Wow. That, now that sounds like a good deal. You know what I mean? Too good to pass up. So I go and tell Jennifer, I said, all right, honey, I'm quitting the army and we're going to go to the seminary. And she's like, oh, really? And I'm like, yeah. And so, uh, so that sounded great. We, we let, let it all settle in and, 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 and God was still kind of working and we're still excited about Jesus, go God and all that. And, and, um, you know, and then she said, Hey, I have great news for you. This was a few months later. And I said, what's that? Cause we was getting ready to just come off active duty, getting ready to get our stuff ready to move over to the campus. She said, I'm pregnant. Oh, that's awesome. Excited. So we're going to have a baby and I'm not going to have a job and we're going to somehow make this all work out. Right. And she's like, yeah, right. No, Brian. So I'm like, okay, so we'll do this. Jennifer had a great job with some good insurance. Thank the Lord for that. Uh, so I come off active duty and went, I was a full-time student. And so we were in seminary together. And, um, and so <clears throat> everything was seemed to be going great until it wasn't at the time, right? So uh, Jennifer started having complications and then she had to uh, not work anymore. She, she had to go at home and, um, and, um, and anyway, so, she had to go to the hospital once in a while because she was having some, uh, you know, abdominal pain. And so we would take her to the hospital. The doctor would look at her and say, you're fine. Just, you know, go back home, get some more rest. You'll be okay. And then it happened again. And then we took her back in. Well, one time uh, we took her in with abdominal pain and they said, you know, what? we're going to keep her and just evaluate her overnight. And I said, okay, that sounds great. So I went back to the seminary and we had, had an event going on there. So I knew that I'd wake up early in the morning to get started. So I, uh, I plugged in my phone. I don't know if you remember the flip phones, the old phones that we had. Well, they never really charged very good. So I decided I was being very brilliant here. This is why I'm not a NASA engineer guy. I would just turn it off and it would charge faster, right? And so I turned it off and plugged it in and, and I went to sleep and it's like a baby. Well, um, I get a knock on the door early in the morning as from a, a security guard and uh, he says, you need to get to the hospital. There's been an emergency. And I'm like, oh my goodness. So I grabbed my phone and, look, and it looked like somebody even left me two or three messages. So I jumped in the car and <clears throat> they drove all the way to the hospital. And not even, I don't even remember the drive getting there. And then I, I come to find out that throughout the night that Jennifer had, uh, had to have an emergency C-section. And, uh, and so uh, Aiken was born two and a half uh, pounds at 10 and a half weeks early. And, and, uh, because of the whole thing that had happened that, you know, it was very scary for Jennifer because we almost lost her and the baby too. Um, so at that point you're, you're sad because this event happened in your life, but you're excited because you have a new baby boy. And then, and then your wife is looking at you like, where you been for the last six hours? And you're like, I was sleeping. And so, I mean, <laughs> So, you know, I had lots of emotions going on in there, but, but we, we got through that. And, um, and uh, you know, uh, Aiken uh, is 21 now, and we're going to be 21 here soon, and, and he's just a, a, a wonderful young man. He's grown up, and you can never tell that, you know, what had happened, but uh, it was pretty scary back then. Um, and I remember just carrying him around uh, in my arms and, and wondering about it. So then I, I, I thought about... You know, is this just our marriage? Is it because we're the only ones who, who, who go through this? Now I'm, I'm kind of looking at you all, and some of you all are, are fairly uh, new, newly married and, and been married for a couple years, but I'm sure your lives were great and you had no challenges in your life, kind of like we did, right? I'm sure everything was good. Well, I, I'm an army chaplain, so no, you, you, can't, you can't lie to me like that. I, I know I hear people all the time in, in conversations that tell me, stories after stories about challenges in their marriage. And, and you know, how, don't come, how come we just didn't know these things were going to happen, you know, when they happen? I'm not so sure uh, why that is, but I, I do know that God's hand is in the midst of it. I know that, that through this process that somehow God is in, involved. And, and I'm thinking about uh, the text in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. It says, consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. You know, that, that, is, a, that is a great text uh, to know, but it's not a good text to understand when you're actually going through the trial itself. You ever had somebody and you're, you're having a tough time and 
you know, maybe your marriage is struggling. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe you lost your job. Uh, you know, maybe we're going through a pandemic. I mean, who knows? I mean, it, stuff happens, right? And somebody comes up to you and just says, consider it all joy. I, I mean, you're just like, how flippant can you be? I mean, that, I, I, I'm struggling here and you want me to consider it all joy? The reason why this text is so important is because the author of this text James, the half-brother of Jesus, you know, he got to see Jesus on the cross. And that, and that was not joy. That was, that was hard. It was hard knowing that you couldn't even tell anybody that you were related to him or that you were a Jesus follower or you would be killed. But yet, James has something that we don't have. But three days later, James saw the resurrected Jesus and he knew that although bad things may happen on Friday, on Sunday is coming, and there's going to be something good there. You see, he had a perspective on life that, that, some, that we don't have. He had a perspective that, that we would have known until we get there. I don't know why Aiken had to come 10 and a half weeks early. I didn't know at the time why Jennifer had to struggle and go through the things that she was struggling with. Another word for considering it all joy, another word could be evaluate. Evaluate your situation when things come along. And know because, because of that, that the greater is the good, the faith that, that's building in you, the perseverance, the faith that you've learned through, through going through the troubles and the trials of how, how you've grown to the other side. That's how you can consider it joy. In seminary, I remember I had an Old Testament history class, and they told us about a symbol that the, the early Christian church used to write. It was a, it was a picture of, of a ship, right? And so you would see the ship, and then you would see the mass that would come across. So you had this ship and this, this picture that they would sometimes write with a finger, or they would draw it on a wall. And so if you were in town, and you wanted to go to church, and you saw that symbol of that ship, you know that you could go to this place and, and there was, they were having church somewhere. This would get you pretty excited because, but you remember, by that time, you can't really associate with being a Christian without having a target on your back because you would have been killed. But you see this and you're excited. It also has another meaning. There's another meaning about this ship that they, that they draw. It, it represents the church of Christ. It represents the church who's, who's sitting in this massive, violent sea that gets tossed and turned to and fro, up and down and around. It gets thrown all over the place. This, this particular ship, the, the Church of Christ, is, is a pictorial vision for us, an understanding that Christ's church is going through many persecutions and when, he, and, and when it's in the world, things are gonna to continue to happen, whether it's good or it's bad. But the whole point of the story is that this ship will eventually reach safe harbor and the cargo of precious human souls will be saved. As we think about heaven and think about where we have to go through to get to the end of the line, that's a great reminder of, of our life sometimes when it seems so chaotic and, and very violent. And then it's being tossed and turned, but we know that, that there is a safe harbor eventually for us to come to. So I started thinking about the Bible. We're, what are stories in the Bible that we've read that we know and understand, but we never realized uh, that exists? So we start in Genesis 1, and, and you start looking through there, and you see Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve was, was a great a uh, couple, the first married couple that, that, that God had performed this marriage, and it was, everything was great until they lost a child. But then Eve, who lost her son, become the mother of all humankind. There was Sarah. Remember Sarah and Abraham? And when, when God and the, and the three friends were, were telling Abraham that Sarah was going to have a baby back behind the tent, she starts laughing, like, are you serious? And then at age 90, she has Isaac. Isaac had two boys, Jacob and Esau, and Jacob stole the birthright from his brother. But yet, Jacob was also the one who wrestled with the angel of God at the river of Jabbok. And then there, 
God changed his name to Israel forever. When you think about Joseph, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers, but become the number two man to Egypt, only, only short of Pharaoh. While we're in Egypt, there's Moses. Mo Moses was enjoying a great life in, in Egypt, and he had everything he could have wanted until he killed a man and then had to run his, from his life. But yet God chose Moses and who he was and all that he represented to take God's people out of, it, out of Egypt. Speaking of running, there was David. David was anointed to be king at a young age, and yet he ran from King Saul the most of his life. But David soon built his own city, the city of David, and eventually his son Solomon was able to build the temple for the Ark of the Covenant. Between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there was 400 years of silence. But the silence was broken the day a little child called Jesus came on the scene. Emmanuel, God is with us, has arrived, and the tables were about to be turned. And just when it seemed like life was out of control, like there was no help in sight, for 400 years we have not heard from the word of God, then Jesus shows up. I'm reminded of Job chapter 10, verse 12, verse 10, Job 12, verse 10, that says, in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. You see, God has it all under control. It's all good when God is involved. The King James Version says, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of mankind. I think about that text and I think about the souls on the ship that's reaching safe harbor. You know what? God is concerning himself in you and your life and in, in your trials and your events each and every day. God is there and he has a grip on you, a God-like grip. Whether you want to believe it or not, he has you and he's not willing to let you go. He loves you and he cares for you and he's established you for this purpose. From the beginning of time, he has predestined your life to be as it is today. Another part of my personal story I'd like to share with you. After 13 months in Iraq, I come back and I meet my family in Morgantown, West Virginia and we receive orders to go to the 6th Recruiting Brigade in Las Vegas, Nevada. And so you imagine telling your wife you was going to Las Vegas for the army. I mean, she thought, she thought I lost my mind, like the army was confused. And so I said, come on, honey, let's get everything packed up. So we did, the U-Haul goes out and the truck goes out and, and then we, we, we load uh, the three of us in the van and, and uh, we head across the country on I-70. I remember the sights of seeing the snow on the, on the mountains in Colorado and feeling the cool breeze air as we rolled down the windows. And then I remember in Utah coming down into Nevada near Las Vegas and, and uh, Jennifer and, and Aiken was watching the, the temperature gauge in the van and it said 86, 91, 99, 101. I mean, at this point we're all going like, really? And it goes 102 and I remember we, we stopped when we get down there uh, to get out and to, just to take a stretch and a, and a break. And uh, we opened the doors and the heat just hits us in our face. And Jennifer's like, where have you taken me? You know, I only know of one place that's this hot and I didn't think it was called Las Vegas. And so, <laughs> so we said, no, honey, this is, this is where God has called us, right? This is our mission. Sometimes we get called to places and, and we have to go. We don't get to pick. Um, if, if we say that, that God is in control and the army or your company or whatever sends you somewhere, you got to believe and trust that God is already preparing the place for you. you got to believe and trust it. So we did. We said God is calling us to Las Vegas for a reason. We're not so sure, but everything was going to be great. Well, uh, as soon as uh, I got there, um, I, you know, the, the army doesn't really wait for you to take time to do your thing. They're like, we, we got to get started. 
So come on, Brian, we've, you're going to recruit through the whole West Coast. And, uh, and I went state after state after state traveling, trying to recruit chaplains for the Army. And so when I'm out enjoying my life and going from hotel to hotel and, and meeting all these wonderful people, going to all these seminaries, uh, Jennifer and Aiken, who's five at the time, were back at, at our house in, in Las Vegas in a foreign desert. So in addition to that, I didn't realize that Jennifer was also in a spiritual desert in her life. And one of the elements I... I didn't, uh, left out to tell you the story is just prior to us leaving West Virginia, um, Jennifer had suffered a, a miscarriage. And, and uh, losing a child is, uh, is a tough thing. And it's not, um, it's not something that's normal that, that anyone can explain to you that, that you've gone through it. But we had church family who was there who come through and and they prayed for us and talked to us. And, and I remember Jennifer just sitting there on the couch, just crying and crying. Our parents would come and, and they tried to console us. And we heard things from our parents about things that happened in their life that we did not even know. But they were able to share their story with us to help comfort us and guide us through that. And so, so by the time we left to go to Las Vegas, I felt like we were in a fairly good place so we decided to try to have um, another, another child, and we got pregnant right away, which is pretty exciting. Well, then not too long after that, she lost the baby, and then we got pregnant again, and then she had another miscarriage. And then, and then we got to a point right at this point where we didn't even know how to pray. We didn't know what we were saying uh, was the right. I mean, we, we went through scripture and we tried to, we, we tried to read the scripture uh, um, and pray that, that God would make this all better. But honestly, we were just struggling and we just didn't know how. And then we started thinking about ourselves. Is this something that we did? Are we not living a, a life, the calling that, that you've called us to be? Are we not in the right place? I mean, we're, God, where, where are you? I, I mean, for goodness, you call me to be a chaplain and I'm ministering to people, but I, I can't even, I don't even know how to minister to my wife. And he reminded me of this text in Romans 8, 26 that said, in the same way, the spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. So I I'm comforted in knowing. Or aren't you comforted in knowing that when you get to that kind of point where, where we were, that the Holy Spirit himself starts interceding for us? I, there are words and things that I don't even not know how to say. I've never been through this. I, this is our third time, and why is this happening? But yet, yet the Holy Spirit was still there, was still present was still active and we didn't even know. I'm thankful for, for church people. I'm thankful for those who mature Christians who have gone through this, who've had those experiences, who came to us and, and helped us through this situation. Uh, one of the churches that we were serving at the time, a vineyard church in, in, in Nevada that Jennifer reached out to a ladies pastor and said, can you, can, you, can I come see you for counseling? And so they did. And I remember there was some prayer going on and, and God started doing some amazing stuff and, and through those meetings. And then, and then it just seemed like God was starting to move again and then all of a sudden we got pregnant again. But we were scared this time because what's going to happen? We don't know. And so, and so we decided, you know, like, like you're supposed to, we, we go over to the hospital on Nellis Air Force Base. And just so it happened that there was a doctor over there that was um, studying uh, this blood clot disorder. And she said, Jennifer, may I test you? And Jennifer's like, sure. So come to find out that Jennifer had this particular blood clot disorder that, that was unreally known, that was is very new uh, to time. And, and, they, and they said, listen, it takes one shot and, and take, uh, you, you would have to, to take a, an aspirin every day and, and come back here every week to get another shot. 
but I, I believe and trust that, that this is what is going on. And, and so, you know, and do you want to have a baby? Yes. Okay. So we're going to do it. Right? Right. So we go back and we, every week and it's like, you know, when you get through one week, it's good. And then next month is good. And next month is good. And eventually we have a full term baby and Hayden is born an air force baby, you know, a, a healthy six and a half pound boy. Right? So he's 14 now. And, and so we have two boys in the count. You know, I think about Hayden and I think about Las Vegas. I tell this story all the time. People don't think it's very funny, but they said, whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, we decided to bring him home with us. We didn't leave him there, just to let you know. He's with us. So, so, that, so that's a good thing. But um, thank God for, for people in the church, mature Christians. Even when you call yourself a Christian, you feel like you know what to say and how to pray and and then there are others who are there who stand by your side. I think of Romans 8, 28. And it says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I, had a, I remember growing up in a church and my granny... My Granny Vance, um, I'm sure you guys have, uh, have had somebody who would drag you to church on Wednesday nights when you never wanted to go. And there was this, this old guy up there, and he had his hanky, and he would, and you know, I don't know why he always carried it around, and then I realized that's all he was kind of wiping off his spit all the time. But, but he would say, he would read this text and say, I know that I know that I know. And then he would move over here and said, I know that I know that I know. And I sat right there thinking, what does he know? <laughs> I, I don't know what he knows. But I know that he had something. He had something special that was going on in his life. You see, this was a mature Christian who understood, who went through trials. He understood that where God is on the opposite side, he was kind of like James that said, yes, that though, though Christ may be crucified, that, that he is resurrected on Sunday. So he knew that he knew that there was a Sunday was coming. And so he would just dab his, 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 his mouth and he would just keep preaching. And, and, and I was so excited, you know, by, by whatever he had to share. Because I knew that God causes all things. He causes good things, neutral things, and bad things to work together for good. Because that's what scripture says. But it wasn't until later until I understood that it was for my eternal good, Right? And so when I start evaluating what the text is, what James would say, consider it all pure joy. When I was evaluating why I would have to do that is because I know that sometimes I have to go through bad things in order for God to change my life because the Brian that, that was born into the sinful world was not the same Brian that he is today. And thank God that God changed me from then until now. And I know that what God had did in me, I am more than a conqueror through Christ because of his word and what he has done through me. Because he first loved me that I may understand how to love others. Did I have to go through all that? Maybe. But I have a wonderful, beautiful family now, and I'm, I'm blessed that I have. There was something else that I left out, and I, I think it's important to share with you something. Be a little bit vulnerable here with you, but... The reason why NASA was so important for me was because of that event that happened in my life. Well, simply what that was is uh, I was married before, and my, uh, uh, my wife and I had our son, Ramsey. And, and after that, I knew that, that God was kind of moving in my life, and I, I wanted to start going to church, and so I did. And then I ended up, uh, my friend Brian Stutler, when he led me to Christ, I was so excited for the Lord. I just, I couldn't stand it. I, I just wanted more of him. Unfortunately, at the time, my, my wife um, did not understand and did not want to have a part of that. And so, uh, so she left. And so when she left and she took my son, and, and so it was a, a challenging for me to try to understand why a good God would allow 
something like that to happen to me in my life. If I gave my life to him, I want to devote all things to him, but yet then I lost my marriage. It wasn't until later I, I look back now and understand. I promise you, I would not change a thing because our son, Ramsey, we have an amazing relationship right now. He's married, and he has his, his own children, we have grandchildren, and we see him on the FaceTime all the time, and so I would never change any of that. But I also say, but because I went through that, I would have never went on active duty. I would have never met Jennifer. I would have never had Hayden, Aiken, and then Hayden, and I would have never been here today. So I think about what kind of trials and things are you going through? What situations in your life that are so hard that you feel like you want to just give up? Or do you want to stand? Stand in, in the promises of God in Romans 8, 28. And know that all things work together for the good. If you do that, God is going to bless you in many ways that you don't even know. I'm evidence to where it is now of somebody who started out long ago as such a child in Christ. And now I'm just here to receive all that he has for me in my life. We are so blessed, so blessed after 22 years. And God wants to bless you too. That's why we're here today. That's why... My story is his story, and I'm sure it's the same as your story. So let me pray for you. Father God, what, a, what an awesome time where we can just move away and let you have room in our life. Father, you've, you have brought us through so many things, and your word tells us to stand and and consider it joy when we faced with trials in this life. But because what we know through, through trials that produces perseverance and our perseverance produces faith in you. And as we come to know you more and more, you're changing us, making us in a new creature of Christ. I am not the same that I was, but I am a new creature who you've caused to be. Lord, I thank you so much for what you've done to me in my life. And may we be a light, Father God, for those who may need to hear the stories that we went through, the tragedies that we have had, the losses that we have suffered. But maybe you're saying, Pastor Brian, <laughs> I, I, everything you said was great, but I, I don't have that kind of relationship. I don't, I don't have, uh, I don't really know the God you're talking about who I could just call and I'm going through stuff right now, and I wish I could. Well, this is for you. If you repeat after me, just say these words. Father God, thank you that you died on the cross for me. Thank you that you've given me a life worth living for. Thank you that you've called me out of the muck and the mire, and you set me up to be one of your children of God. Lord, I pray these things so my life will be changed for eternity. And thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right, let's pray with those there today.